Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. My name is Anna Maria Rubiano, and I am the director of events here for student government at Biscayne Bay Campus. Um, and today we have the opportunity um, to ask our president any questions and express any concerns we may have in regards to our campus and FIU as a whole. All we ask is that you please raise your hand so we can do our very best to get to every question. Also, if you're watching us via live stream, welcome. And without any further ado, here is our Assistant Vice President, Dr. Anthony DeSantis. Good afternoon, everybody. What a lovely crowd, I love it. My name is Anthony DeSantis, I'm the Assistant Vice President for Student Affairs, and I wanna welcome you to the 12th Annual Town Hall meeting at BBC. Um, for those of you who have not had a chance to meet me, I started here in October of um, October 9th, and I'm the Assistant Vice President for Student Affairs here at BBC, and I also serve as the Chief Student Affairs Officer here at BBC as well. Um, many of you in the audience have had an opportunity to meet, and for those who I haven't, I look forward to hopefully today or at some point in the next week or so, get a chance to meet with you personally. I want to thank uh, SGA BBC for hosting this event today. Well, if you can give them a huge round of applause for putting this together. As you're heading out and leaving today's event, if you see any of the Wolf University Center staff, please make sure to thank them. And also, um, you know, the team with SGA, the full-time staff that have worked with them as well, thank you for hosting this event. This forum will give students and staff and faculty the opportunity to learn about what's occurring here at BBC and also to learn about what we're working on in the future, some of our future projects, events, and services that we're looking to bring to this campus, uh, as well as some of the colleges that are in the audience to talk a little bit about what they're doing. This is your opportunity. Um, this is a great turnout. I'm really excited about everyone that's here today. Uh, and for everyone that is live streaming today, that's attending and watching, thank you so much for doing that as well. Um, I just personally, I, so a lot of people in the audience have had an opportunity to meet with um, administrators, some of the faculty, some of the staff, especially those in the Division of Student Affairs. I wanna thank you on behalf of me uh, for saying thank you to help me with my transition here at, at RFIU and especially here at BBC, so thank you so much. It's my pleasure now that I wanna to bring to the stage uh, and, and please now help me in welcoming FIU's fifth president, Dr. Mark B. Rosenberg. Thank you, Anthony. Thank you. Anthony, thank you. Welcome to FIU, you've hit the ground running and uh, that's, that's exactly what we expected and that's exactly what's necessary. Uh, here at our incredible university. Happy New Year to those of you who I haven't seen. This uh, 2018 promises to be even uh, more impactful and rapid than 2017. We're expecting really good things, both in our community and here uh, in our university. And there's really no, no better example of the good things happening than here at our uh, Biscayne Bay uh, campus. And I have a really, really great announcement that I'm going to make, but I'm going to hold it till the end uh, about, uh, about our campus. So uh, over the years, we've had opportunities to have these dialogues and these discussions. They, they, they vary in, in, in impact from uh, issues that relate to transportation or to food or to academic programming, and they're evidence of the fact that you care, that this community cares, that we're in it together to build a, a better educational experience for our students, uh, build a better working experience for our professional staff and our faculty. So I want you to know that I appreciate very much the fact that, that so many of you are here and so many of, of you care. This, this uh, beautiful Biscayne Bay campus is, is and will always be an integral part of the FIU family. We are one. I often get asked, well, what's the difference between uh, our uh, different sites? And I say, well, essentially, they're different locations, but the purpose is the same, to ensure 
that students learn to ensure that they can graduate and either get a great job or take a great job and to provide lifelong learning opportunities because we know that the economy is changing so quickly that you're going to have to continue to, to get more learning and we hope that you'll continue to choose our, our, our university. We are at one family because we understand that this South Florida peninsula, this South Florida environment is fragile. We appreciate the incredible diversity. Uh, we're, we like the fact that there are significant opportunities here for growth. Uh, there are significant educational achievements in our community, whether it's uh, the Miami-Dade County Public Schools or Miami-Dade College or indeed FIU where one can get a, a, a really, really good education. And so uh, I'm optimistic for these reasons and more, uh, as, you will, as you will hear. We've, we've had the opportunity to have a conversation with Amazon. You know that Amazon is looking at our community. One of, we're one of 20 communities in the United States that Amazon wants to build its second uh, world headquarters. And that, that opportunity speaks to the fact that, that companies like Amazon see us being very much a part of the future uh, as a community. And when I think about that future, and when I think about who we are and what we do, I see us as being a cluster of talent. Uh, I, that this university, if you think about it, the incredible student talent that we have here, the incredible professional staff talent. We're going to talk about that uh, in a minute and the dedication of our professional staff. And then the faculty who want to be here, who want to be in South Florida, who want to work uh, with our students, who understand uh, who we are and who are passionate about that. Indeed, last fall we recognized uh, one of the, the best uh, freshman classes that we've ever had a GPA of 4.1. That's the highest GPA of any entering class we have ever had. And what it suggests is that, that students understand that they don't have to go away if they want to get a great education on one hand, and it also speaks to the incredible achievement of the Dade County Public Schools in graduating students more, more students, and graduating them with a, a better education and in ensuring that they could be competitive right here in their own hometown uh, to get into our, our university. We're, we're, we have some of the best and brightest right here. Uh, Jefferson Noel, I think many of you know Jeff. Uh, uh, he, yes, yeah, Jeff here. I don't know that he's here today. There he is. There's Jeff right here. Yeah. There's Jeff. Yeah. I'm a little envious because he got his inspiration while he was getting a haircut. I don't get many haircuts anymore, folks. Uh, but he got inspiration uh, at a heated discussion at a barber shop, and that's when an idea came to him that uh, that indeed barber sh uh, the barber shop could be used as a as a site as a platform to host discussions that impact our community, and that's how his program, uh, Barber Shop Speaks, was born. And today he's expanding. Uh, his, his conversations and creating opportunities for everyone and anyone to share their experiences. And uh, he's still a proud Panther. He graduated, many of you know, just a few months ago, World's Ahead graduate. But now he's decided to stay right here, which we consider we're very proud of that. And he's working on his master's degree in global communications at RFIU. This is the kind of talent and grit and perseverance and determination and vision that is characteristic of our students. They understand that, that this education is very precious and they got to do something with it. And Jeff is a great, great representative of using education, taking responsibility, and getting things done. And because of students like Jeff and you, uh, we've, we've never been stronger. And, and, and we know this using as an example the recent uh, hurricane season. By the way, we're about five months from hurricane season, folks. Yeah, just, you know, 
just when you were relaxing a little bit. But let me tell you, I'm so proud of, of our FIU family for coming together with FIU Strong. And there's so many stories, so many stories about how you stepped up, how you took responsibility in the days after the storm. Countless unsung heroes right here uh, in this auditorium. But I do want to I, I do want to tell you one story, uh, and it makes me very, very proud. And that's the story of our, our, our professional staff here, Abel Rodriguez, Richard Penns, and Aaron Johnson, three members of the, of the team here that keep this place looking beautiful, individuals who have a lot of pride in who we are and what we do and, and, and who make our lives better. Well, they came together uh, during the storm, uh, pushed through to do what's right and, and what's good for our FIU. You see, before the storm, they put in 10 to 12 hour days to fill 200 sandbags and install more than 1,000 shutters. Now, I got to tell you that sometimes putting shutters up is the right thing to do, but when I was putting shutters up one day, this was uh, right before Hurricane Andrew, I called my one of the, the fellows who I who knows storms, I said, Richard, I, do you think I need to put my, sh my storm shutters up? He says, yeah, he says, go ahead, put your storm shutters up. Wind's going to blow the roof off anyway, but at least you have the shutters up. But we put the thousand <laughs> storm shutters up. And, um, and, um, and after the hurricane, uh, the, Abel, Richard, and Aaron came together, and they continued to work hard to get us back on our feet. Uh, they each had their fair share of getting back to the campus. You know how hard it was uh, right after a storm to get back here. A 45-minute commute turned into a three-hour commute. A concrete pole land in a driveway, can't get your car out, a flooded apartment. But nothing could keep them uh, from helping the campus uh, get ready uh, for our, our students and fellow uh, staff people to, to, to get back here so we could get on with the business of education. Are they here? Are you here this afternoon, uh, gents? I was hopeful that they would be here. They're not. When you see them, thank them. Remind them of your appreciation uh, for, for uh, what they've done. This is, this is who we are. People go out beyond the normal and, and do, do something special so that this university can, can be special. And because of you, RFIU has never been more focused on being a solution center. We're helping to solve some of society's most pressing problems. Last year, we received a $13.1 million grant from the National Institute on Minority Health and Health Disparities. This is the largest grant that we've ever gotten uh, from the National Institute of Health. And with it, we're going to create the first health disparities research center on minority, uh, at, a, at a minority institution. We're also going to be hiring three additional researchers, five new fellows, as well as postdoctoral talent. And I know that, that, um, that she's going to mention it, but in just a couple of weeks, uh, through our communication program, we're going to do a hackathon on sea level rise. We are engaged in identifying solutions that can make a difference uh, for our community. Uh, we've never been more committed as well to preparing students to, to get great jobs. We know that's important. We know that our students go into debt. Our students sacrifice. Our students make decisions every day to get their education, believing in us, believing that if they get that education, they can stay ahead uh, of things. And we have to do our part at the university. I'm really proud of the fact that we just initiated a new degree program. It's called the Internet of Things. The Internet of Things. And uh, there's only a handful of similar degrees at universities uh, in the world. We're the first in the United States. This degree is going to give our students the, comp the competencies they're going to need to be competitive in the workforce. Now, to be sure, the Internet of Things. The estimate is right now that there are about 10 billion devices that are connected to the Internet, but that over the next two decades, that growth will be exponential. It could be 
up to 50 billion devices that are connected. You'll be able to control your household from, from, from your handheld device. Uh, you'll be able to control if you have a car or if you don't, you'll be able to get transportation at a minute's notice. That's the internet of things. And so we want our students to be ready for that. So I'm really thrilled that our faculty uh, and that our board decided, yeah, we got to get there to help our students uh, be ready. Because of you, uh, our FIU is also an institution that honors our veterans. Are there any veterans here in the, uh, in the auditorium, Marianne Wolf Theater? Could you please stand and be recognized? Veterans, I want you to stand. Stand, veterans. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for your service and sacrifice. Let me tell you, whenever we can thank a veteran, we need to do that. And we did, we've done that in the case of one such uh, student who graduated from our FIU, Michael Felsberg, who was killed in action uh, in Iraq. And we, we established the Felsberg Veterans Memorial. Uh, it's, a des it's designed to be a place of reflection, commemoration, hope. We want to pay tribute to all our veterans. That wouldn't have happened without the Miami-based law firm of Genovese, Joblov, and Batista, and without the support of, of, a, of Bert Cabanas. Many of you know Bert, hospitality graduate from this campus. Bert is also a Marine, and Bert made it happen uh, together with that law firm. We invite you to visit this Felsberg's memorial to get a sense of proportion about all the sacrifice that has been made by individuals, particularly veterans, so that we can live, we can live in freedom. And then last, because of you, we've never been better. As you know, last summer, our FIU was named a great college to work for by the Chronicle. We were the only university, and I, I love this, I just, I don't know how it happened, but we're the only university in the country last year to achieve honor roll designation with recognition in all 12 categories. All 12, we're the only university in the country, ladies and gentlemen, that's, that's because of you. And, and it does, it does reflect, it does reflect the deep, the deep commitment that, that those of us who are privileged to be at this university, the deep commitment that we have to our student success, to student achievement, to student uh, well-being. And um, so I want to thank you uh, for that. Now, that celebration, during that celebration, we also had a little opportunity to remember that um, we have performance, we're in a performance funding regime. So we, un, we, we, we uh, allowed Los Metrics, which is a group of FIU vice presidents. So, Justin Timberlake has called to see if we could, uh, <laughs> if we could uh, lend uh, our dancers uh, to him, and uh, but he made it clear not for the Super Bowl. Uh, but at any rate, we're very focused on the metrics. We know more about our institution today than we ever have. We know how long it takes students to graduate. Uh, we we find ways to eliminate bottlenecks. Uh, we measure. Uh, every department and how well they're doing with retention and graduation. And I'm really proud of the fact that, that we are very focused and we are getting better. We're getting better on the six-year graduation rate. We're getting better on the four-year graduation rate. We're getting better on students who enroll uh, in, as, as FTICs and then come back the next year. And we're getting better because we know that many of you find a way to help to ensure, to remember, to ensure that our students come first. And if our students come first, we're going to come first as an institution. So I, I want to thank you very much for that. And indeed, we are moving those metrics uh, forward. We report every year to the Board of Governors, uh, and the Board of Governors in Tallahassee has very high expectations uh, for us. So 
These metrics, we won't go over them today, but I just want you to understand how important they are to what we do. Our funding is driven by our ability to be successful in these domains. So you're going to see more and more out there about the metrics and how we can be even uh, more, more impactful in achieving and exceeding the goals uh, that the BOG uh, has set to us. And the bottom line is we don't get funding unless a student graduates and we don't get funding unless that student can graduate timely and in this case it's four-year graduation rates that are in particular are the object of affection for the Board of Governors. Now we understand that not everybody's going to be able to graduate in four years. We get that, uh, but um, I can tell you that significant amount of funding rides on our ability to keep getting better and better. And I'd like to think that each and every one of you, whether you're a student, you're a member of the professional staff, you're a member of the faculty, that you're going to figure out what your responsibility is, take that responsibility, and help us uh, to get there. Uh, last week, last year, we did announce for this year several ways for our students to graduate on time. And I'm really proud of our, our program called Golden Promise. This, this program is, enables first-time students who enroll, if they don't have the financial support to start at FIU, FIU will take responsibility for that financial support. Indeed, this, for this year, we had 1,130 students where we covered 100% of the students' tuition. Regardless, regardless of whether they were a 3.9 or a 4-point student or a 3.5 student, we covered uh, their tuition if they de could demonstrate uh, financial need. And I am very proud of that. Many of you know that as an institution of higher education, we depend on Pell Grants, which are federal grants for students uh, to, to get their educations. In that, in that mix, about, uh, in terms of Pell Grants, we have approximately 25,000 students, undergraduates who are on Pell Grants. Half of those students are on full Pell, which means they get no family support. Think of that. About 14,000 of our undergraduate students don't get any family support at all. They are fully paying for their education. And we are very proud. I know many of you are, 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 are those students. We're very proud of the fact that you're able to find a way to get your education, to work, to support your families, and that you're going to graduate on time. And we're really excited about the Golden Promise uh, program. We also have a specialized pathway option uh, called the Supported Transition to Excellence Program, or STEP for short. And in this, students are admitted into this program or limited to a certain number of credit hours, and over time, their co course loads will increase. We're also asking students to earn 30 credit hours in a year's time uh, with a 2.0 GPA. If you do that, for the next year, we'll give you a $500 success grant, uh, that particularly for the sophomore year. In other words, we're trying to build incentives in for our students to be successful in a timely manner and to continue their progression. If you have, if you're a professional staff member and you are talking to students on a day-to-day -day basis and you're not aware of these programs, we ask you to get aware of them so that you can be better uh, you can be a better ad, uh, advisor, informal or formal, to them about their options. Nobody should leave FIU because there's not enough financial aid. We work hard every year to raise financial aid dollars and to package them to make it possible for our students uh, to succeed. We also have dedicated advisors. We're, we're, they work hard every day for our students. Uh, particularly focusing them on how to get 30 some credit hours uh, during the academic year so that they can graduate uh, in four years. And I want to thank our advisors for all they do for our students. Over the last three or four years, we've hired nearly 70 advisors to make sure that our students can graduate 
uh, timely. A part of contributing uh, to student success and meeting our goals is by putting students first uh, to give them so that they get the tools and the facilities that they need uh, to succeed in this, 21st, in this 21st century. Over the past year, we've expanded opportunity, we've brought new programs uh, to this campus, and I wanna, wanna talk to you about them. One of the questions that I got last year at the town hall was, of course, what about the new program? So let me tell you about them. Uh, last year, we unveiled our new and improved BBC a University Testing Center. It has new test stations and computers, enhanced security systems, white noise machines, and more. It's a major stepping stone uh, to student success. Uh, when our students have the opportunity to, take a, to, opportunity to take a placement exam that tells them what courses work best for them, they do better and they succeed. That's so important that we get students in the right place uh, at the right time. They can stay on track, uh, they can graduate on time, or they can indeed uh, graduate uh, earlier. Um, our testing center is also here to serve our community. It's where local high school students like our MAST at FIU students uh, who are right here, they can come and take their SAT test uh, right at FIU and then hopefully do well enough to continue here. Our testing center also provides testing for hundreds of industry certifications. You may think that's not important. But the world of higher ed over the next two decades is going to radically transform so that certifications are part and parcel of every student's educational experience. If you're not aware of certifications and how they work, or if you're in a program or discipline that doesn't think you're going to have certifications, you probably need to spend more time understanding how automation and, and uh, job, job creation are going to occur and the impact it's going to have on our workforce and the impact it's going to have on us. So this issue of certifications is very, very important. So check out this amazing uh, resource. I'm also very excited about what we're calling food FIU. Uh, do we have any aspiring food or beverage entrepreneurs here today? Not necessarily beverage drinkers here, but entrepreneurs. The good news is that we, we created here uh, in the Chaplain School our startup called FIU Food. Launched last April in partnership with the Chaplain School. This offers uh, FIU food entrepreneurs across South Florida, state-of-the-art commercial kitchen facilities. It also provides access to workshops, mentorship, opportunities, as well as assistance. Look, the reality is that South Florida is an entertainment mecca, and that the food, food aspect of that entertainment is getting more and more prominent. And so we want to be at the cutting edge of that. That's why I'm really thrilled about this new uh, incubator. Uh, and here's some more good news. As some of you might know the 17th annual Oh, I want to I want to make sure that for those of you <clears throat> did I need that? <laughs> it wasn't on. So I want I want to make sure that uh, those of you who do want to go, we do have discounted tickets. Maybe Mike will talk about that. But it's important that if you of all these events that you partake of, you're in South Florida. Let's go. Let's enjoy it. And we're the ones who are the primary beneficiaries because of the scholarship money uh, that, that we replace. But, but our initiatives don't end there. 
I'm really proud of the fact that the Health Services Administration program is, is currently translating to the Biscayne Bay campus. After the summer semester, all health services courses are going to be, will only be offered here at this campus. Uh, this, this program it has been a leader uh, in our community in providing state-of-the-art education curriculum to students wishing to pursue careers in health services. By the way, I mean, health is not, is, is probably the major issue of the 21st century, and uh, that's where a lot of the new jobs are going to be in the health area. So what better place than to get your, uh, than to get your, uh, your education here in that field? We expect jobs to increase in the health field by about 20% between 2016 and 2026. Also, I'm really proud of the fact that the kinesiology uh, program is moving to this campus. Now, I want you to note the spelling of kinesiology, folks, because I asked one of our vice presidents, why did we name a program kinesiology when it's hard to spell? And uh, it's actually not that hard to spell if you look at the words, but more importantly, this is the program which was formerly known as our Bachelor of Science in Physical Education. And it's being moved to this campus. Courses are, are, have already uh, started to be offered, and the program should be fully moved uh, by this fall as well. It's going to have a new lab uh, with all new equipment that's going to give students the hands-on learning they need. Better prepared students, better prepared for the job market, better prepared to make a good life. We're also proud of the fact that Richard Blanco, Richard Blanco, yes, he got a degree in engineering from FIU, but he also got a second degree in creative writing for FIU. As many of you know him as the uh, poet for the second inauguration of the President of the United States. And there was Richard Blanco in January of 2012 uh, in the, at the inauguration reading a poet to hundreds of millions of people, a poem, reading a, a poem to hundreds of millions of people watching the inauguration. And it was our Richard Blanco, our FIU Richard Blanco. And Richard Blanco has just passed a semester here teaching, teaching uh, writing occasional poetry. We hope he comes back. It was incredible to have such a famous person, well-known, impactful person, right here on the campus uh, with us, uh, helping us to be better poets. And I know each and every one of us has some poetry in us. But that's not all that's happening. This year we're going to do uh, something different, in fact, at this program. You see, we're going to allow time for MAST at FIU, FIU's College of Communication, Architecture, and the Arts, and for our chaplain school to share their updates with you. Normally it's just me, but this university is far more than the president. Uh, we've got so many talented people uh, who, who are engaged uh, with us. But let me recognize Henry Nunez first. Henry uh, is... Uh, coordinator of the RCL Entertainment Studios. Henry here, I think he was going to be here. Maybe he's on his way. It's a long, it's a long distance to get here. Um, RCL is a great partner uh, to our FIU, and their presence, their presence here gives us, our students, unprecedented internship opportunities, experiential learning, which you're going to be seeing more and more of, and, um, and gives us a, re a direct relationship with one of our communities and one of our world's great companies uh, in RCL. So MAST is another example of a win-win-win partnership. It lives and breathes right here at our FIU. I had the privilege to be at the, at the opening of MAST and also to be at the first graduating class, uh, which occurred this past spring. It was gratifying to see so many students who had taken their high school experience here at FIU, graduated FIU, and nearly half of those graduates are continuing uh, right here at FIU as part of the class of 2021. Are any of those students in the house? 
uh, today who graduated in first graduating class. Okay, they're studying, I'm sure. Um, but let me introduce to you the MAST uh, principal, MAST at FIU principal. His name is Matthew Welker. Most of you know him. He is a four-time, a four-time graduate of FIU. Four degrees from RFIU. And he's here to share some, some exciting news with us. So give a warm Panther welcome to Principal Matthew Welker. Thank you, President Rosenberg, for that uh, great introduction. Little history lesson, August of 2013, two, and I use the word precisely, titans of South Florida education. Our President Mark Rosenberg and Superintendent Alberto Carvalho came together to form a very unique partnership, which resulted in the Marine Academy of Science and Technology at FIU. And I'm happy to report that four years later, we have significant results. Let me step off a little bit here because I really don't like speaking behind the podium. The premise of this blended high school university experience was to bridge the gap that often befalls students when they make their way between high school and university life. We wanted the experience to be intensive, rigorous, and caring. And I'm happy to report that over the more than four years that we've been on this campus, that we have more than met our metrics. We continue to grow in educational programming so that every student who is eligible may take dual enrollment in every single grade unheard of in public education in South Florida. Uh, more than a third of our students are enrolled as part-time or full-time students here at FIU, more than any other high school probably in the state of Florida. As President Rosenberg pointed out, many of our students elect to stay here, which really warms my heart because I have a very, very warm spot in my heart for this university, as you can certainly tell and hear. I'm happy to report, President Rosenberg, that 100% of our graduates met the four-year requirement. <laughs> <laughs> Educational programming, which is the heart of a high school experience, is full and robust, as I mentioned previously. Beyond that, the experiences of working and being educated within a blended high school and university environment go well beyond the traditional high school setting. The opportunity for students to interact with their fellow students here at FIU, as well as the faculty and staff, bridges that gap and makes them feel very, very comfortable, as I mentioned, as a result of their election to stay here and continue their education. We are very much about the same metrics that the university is keenly aware of retention, graduation rates, matriculation, and how well our students do post-secondary. And by all measures, our students are doing very well. The greater percentage of our students who don't remain at FIU do remain within the Florida University system, take advantage of all the wonderful scholarships and opportunities they have through Bright Futures and the like. Most recently, we had the first South Florida Eco Hero Award winner one of our students who won a trip to Antarctica with Ron Miguel and Christy Krueger and Channel 10. Perhaps you heard of that. And as of uh, this weekend, we have two students who are going to be participating at the state science fair level. And we had winners in both robotics and uh, generation, Florida power and light generators. So the horizon looks great for our students. We continue to excel. The one thing that I'm asked the most is not about how wonderful our students are, it's typically, when are we getting a building? And believe me, I want that to happen just as well. The superintendent has indicated that we hope to have one in place by certainly August of 2019 or maybe winter of 2020. So the horizon looks good for us. We're going to continue to move forward. Each year, 
we gain more perspective about how important our place is and the appreciation that we have for this university. I thank you all. Thank you, Principal Welker. And, you know, the truth is the notion of blended education, this is where we're going as well. We're not just going to certifications and badges. We're, gonna, we're finding ways to ensure that education is seamless across, across the so-called delivery systems. And there's no better example of that, on one hand, than dual enrollment, which we, are, we spend a lot of time on at this university, but then having the facility and the presence of those students right here on this campus is, uh, is really a harbinger of things to come in terms of models of, of education. And so thank you very much in believing in us and for your leadership with MAST, uh, Matthew Welker. I'm really happy as well that, that Marilee Snepomeche, Associate Dean for Strategic Initiatives, Professor of Architecture in the College of Communication, Architecture, and the Arts, is here today. She's going to share some updates with us. Dr. Nepomich. Thank you. Um, appreciate your having me here today. Dean Schreiner apologizes for not being here um, and sending me on his behalf. He actually is in FIU's Washington, D.C. Center with the chairs of our departments of communication and journalism and media, setting up a whole series of really exciting new initiatives that include internships, lectures, symposia, new opportunities in journalism, um, and a new opportunity for a DC Bureau of our South Florida News Service. Hopefully, as these um, new initiatives develop, we will be able to report on them perhaps at the next town hall. Um, what we do have to talk about today, in addition to that, is a series of initiatives that we think are particularly um, productive um, for all of our students. And the students, um, CARDA has a number of programs here at BBC. The ones you probably know best are the SCJ, the School of Communication and Journalism. But we also have a presence in the Department of Art and Art History, the Department of Theater, the Department of Music, the School of Music. Um, all of the facilities that we have begun to renovate on behalf of our students at BBC support and advance the development of technical, creative, and entrepreneurial skills for our students, mentorship opportunities, internship opportunities, engaged interactive learning opportunities, career and job market readiness, and embeddedness in the urban and professional context in the 21st century economy of Miami and South Florida. I want to talk to you about the image on the screen. It's our brand new SCJ Integrated Media and Communication Studio. It opened its doors this semester. And we have a grand opening and ribbon cutting scheduled for two months from now on the 12th of April. Um, this was the result of realizing that a state-of-the-art newsroom and media lab are critical components of all the most successful schools of communication and journalism anywhere in the country. We want RFIU students to have exactly those opportunities, and we're bringing them to you. Um, in addition for to providing, oh, if we could go back one. In addition to providing um, spaces for um, learning, we also have two critical um, agencies and um, services that are student run. The Bold Agency is um, a media, is part of the Department of Communication. It provides services that include social media, branding, strategy, creating, advertising, crisis planning, public relations, and market research. And our South Florida News Service, Department of Journalism and Media, is a digital journalism, youth-focused, multilingual digital platform. All of them will have space in this new space. Okay. Our next really exciting brand new opening is in support of our Department of Art and Art History. It is the Radcliffe Art and Design Incubator that we've been able to create thanks to the generosity of the Philip E. and Carol R. Ratcliffe Foundation. Um, the Art and Design 
incubator is intended to bridge the gap between talent and entrepreneurship success for our students. It will provide them tools and support that they need to turn their ideas into profitable businesses. It's just completed our group, our first set of fellows and students are moving in as we speak. The grand opening is, is planned for later this year. In addition, we've got um, new, new opportunities coming up in 2019 and later in 2018. We have new dedicated lab space for exciting new augmented and virtual reality initiatives, as well as a newly renovated SCJ broadcast studio. Um, Updates and events. In support of our students in the School of Music and the Department of Theater, and in partnership with Royal Caribbean World Stage, we have cutting edge experimental lend, uh, learning, experiential learning from leading professionals in the field through master classes that are in progress for our School of Music students and for our Department of Theater students. We have an upcoming job fair for the School of Journalism and Media. Um, we have the Lillian Lodge Copenhaver Center which has its annual uh, Women in Communication Conference coming up on April the 5th. And a part of that conference, titled Moving Ahead, will be at FIU DC um, on May 15th. In addition, the President just told you earlier about our new Resilience Open Data Day Hackathon, which will happen on March the 3rd, which focuses on strategies for application and visualizations in order to create more resilient communities. We are delighted and happy at the opportunity to serve our students at BBC. Thank you. I can tell you that uh, having been a dean here on this campus in the mid-90s, that uh, we, we never dreamed about, couldn't even dream about some of the activities and initiatives that have just been described for you. We didn't dream about those then. We dreamed about a lot, but it's really amazing the kinds of initiatives that are taking place on this campus, and the kinds of opportunities we've been able to generate as a consequence of the creativity uh, of our faculty, the hard work of our professional staff, and the interest of our students. And perhaps uh, nowhere is that better seen than, than in our Chaplain School of Hospitality and Tourism Management. Let me ask uh, Michael Chang to give us an update about the Chaplain School. Thank you, Mr. President. <clears throat> um, as uh, Mr. President said, we have the upcoming South Beach Wine Food Festival that's starting next week. And uh, it's going to kick off next Wednesday with our first dinner at, at, in Fort Lauderdale. Um, this is a festival that attracts a lot of Food Network and uh, cooking channel stars like Alton Brown, Guy Fieri, Emeril Lagasse. And this year, we will be honoring uh, the super talented Bobby Flay at the tribute dinner on Saturday. Did you know he was the only chef and the first chef to have his own star at the Hollywood Walk of Fame? And he has restaurants all over the world, and from New York to Las Vegas to Bahamas. Um, along that, too, we are also still looking for a few student volunteers if you're interested. And uh, you do get a scholarship for participating, and you'll have the opportunity to work and, and gain experience at a large scale event like this that serves over 64,000 guests over a four day weekend. Um, so if you're interested, please go to HM 243 on the second floor of the hospitality building to sign up. We're also going to be reinstating the luncheons and dinners from the Advanced Food Production Management course starting this fall. I know it's exciting. <laughs> so, <clears throat> so expect to see one luncheon and one dinner a week starting this fall. Um, it, along with the festival, we've put together a class, a two-semester festival management class. And you'll, you'll be able to, that's going to solely focus on the festival. So you'll learn how to work with the event managers, uh, the planners, sponsorships, marketing to execute an event of this uh, size. But this, it's not just for this festival. You will also support the brew fest that we do in North Miami. 
Starting this semester, we are also going to be bringing back the Michael Hurst Dean's Lecture Series and kicking off the lecture series is Reginald Washington, a graduate of 1974. For those of you who don't know Michael Hurst, he was a professor here and former chairman of the National Restaurant Association as well as former owner of the 15th Street Fisheries in Fort Lauderdale. And our first speaker here, Reginald Washington, is also a distinguished alum from 1974, also former chairman of the National Restaurant Association, and currently CEO and president of Jose Branded Foods in Atlanta. And then lastly, in other news from the Chaplin School, we're going to be offering more dynamic scheduling of courses, as well as creating more opportunities for study abroad courses in many terms. And all of these efforts are aimed at pro providing more flexibility in your schedule and getting you to graduate in four years. Thank you. So I want to repeat that um, even if you might not be a hospitality major, we are seeking interns to work at the event. It's a great experience. It's an opportunity to meet some of the world's leading chefs, to meet some of the world's leading vintners, and to have some fun at a, at a premier event and also to get a little scholarship money to cover your costs for that. So please, if you're, if you're not too sure what you're going to be doing that weekend, what a great opportunity to get practical experience. If you're a student, goes on your resume and may even open doors for you in terms of your future. So thank you very much, Michael. I did want to thank as well student government from the Biscayne Bay campus for being, would you please rise and be recognized, student government? Thank you very much for your leadership. Thanks for all that you do to make our, our environment better. We appreciate you very much. Thank you. And now, uh, I did promise you a very special announcement. So, you know that the, that the university is not just a place where you walk into a classroom. It's not just a place where you have time to go to the library or to do a research paper or to be with an organization that does good things in our community through philanthropy, whether it's Dance Marathon or, or uh, the, our Cancer March or some of the other incredible uh, fundraising activities uh, that happen. But the university is also a place to celebrate the life of the mind. And the mind is not just about the, the classroom experience. The mind is about cultivating aesthetics and a sense of appreciation for the environment, a sense of appreciation for art. And so you know that if, you're, if, you're, if you walk around this campus, you'll see some, some nice pieces of art if you walk around the the, the uh, MMC campus, you'll see uh, nice pieces of art. As a matter of fact, there's a, a lovely welcoming piece uh, to the MMC campus at the, uh, on the, off of the 107th Street entrance. How many of you have seen that big, flaming, red Lieberman sculpture? Okay, so I am very pleased to announce this afternoon, that thanks to the generous donation by Mr. Michael B. Smith, our Biscayne Bay campus will be the permanent home of the sculpture Ariel by the artist Alexander Lieberman. This is, will be part of our sculpture garden. And yes, this looks a little familiar, but it's different. This is Ariel, this is not Argosy. And so, we will, we will be blessed from here henceforth forward to our two campuses being graced by the amazing work of, of the sculptor, uh, Mr. Lieberman. And they're going to remind us once again that we are one at FIU. But we're going to let you, our students, our faculty, our staff, choose where we will place the statue. Uh, we've opened up an Instagram poll, and uh, for the next 24 hours, you can visit uh, my Instagram at FIUPres5 uh, via the stories options, 
and let me know where you think REL should go. And so, students, you can tell your friends, staff, you can tell your friends to vote. I'd like to get your advice on where we should place this incredible uh, Lieberman statue. And um, we, I want to thank the Office of Advancement for already procuring the statue, uh, the sculpture. It's, it's ready. Now we just have to find the right place for it uh, as you enter this incredible, beautiful uh, Biscayne Bay campus. We'll leave this up for a little bit for those of you who want to make sure that you, uh, that you have the right, uh, the right location. I want to thank you all for your uh, incredible attention. I want to thank you for being committed to building a better university, for your commitment to hope and opportunity, for your commitment to student achievement. That's what brings us together. That's what unites us as one FIU. So now we'll take questions and answers. Uh, at least if you don't have a question, you can, you can make a comment. That's fine. And there are many of our staff here who, if I can't answer it, I will ask them to answer the, the, the question. Thank you all very much. Let's open the floor for discussion. Comment. Okay, well, here's the first question. Yes, sir, in the white shirt. We're going to bring a mic. Would you please identify yourself? so that uh, we can uh, know who you are. Hi, I'm Henry. I'm um, an FIU student. Uh, and I was curious as to which option, where would you like to see the, stu the statue placed, the Lieberman statue? <laughs> well, I, I don't really have a favorite spot. I'm interested in impact. And so I think you all can figure out what your own basis for making the decision is. You have three locations potentially, there may be others. We do feel it should be at or near the entryway to FIU because that's the, if you will, the brand uh, that, that, that we have uh, that, um, that will help to identify the institution. What are you thinking about? What do you like? Okay, option two. All right, any, do I have any option one? <laughs> we don't have a noise meter here, Jeff, so it's not going to help. Okay, I got, I got a woo for number one. I heard, okay, let's do this again. So option one. Okay, option two. Option three. <laughs> so, but you got to vote. I mean, you know, this participatory democracy, technology works. So let's get your vote in. And uh, if you don't have INSA, you might, you might get it, and this will enable you to, to, uh, to vote. So good. Okay, yes, all the way in the back. Mike? Okay, let, let's ask uh, 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 Brenny Garcia will explain this. Hi. Hello. Yep. Okay. Uh, so if you go on Instagram, follow Dr. Rosenberg at FIU, Pro, uh, FIU Press 5. And then if you click on his photo, it takes you to the Instagram stories. And then uh, just keep on clicking through. And at the bottom, each photo has a yes or no. It's a live poll. So click yes or no as you go through each one. You're welcome. And this is for mass too. Don't, we don't want you to tell us you were disenfranchised here. Okay. So everybody got that? Okay. Yes, sir. Would you identify yourself and... Uh, Question, please. Sure. Thanks, President Rosenberg. Mark Sell. Hey, Mark. I am a member of the community, uh, and I have a business consultancy, and I also write a column for the Biscayne Times on occasion. Right. Uh, my question for you is a neutral one, really. What can you say about your short, medium, and long-term capital plans for this campus and as it relates for the school as a whole? Go to what, what's immediate, what's medium-term, and then wish list. Thanks. Short term, uh, short term is to get the mast uh, high school built. That's very, very important. We're also just finishing up the parking lot, which was, you know, a question of the last of last uh, conversation. And uh, medium uh, for this campus is an expansion of the chaplain school, which we see as very, very important. We also would like to have a, a gallery here that would be. Um, a source that where we could display art that our students produce as well as that our faculty produce. We think that's very important. Uh, we need a gallery. Uh, beyond that, in terms of the, the long term, 
we would like to see a, uh, a um, how shall we say, perhaps a bigger recreation uh, a capability that goes with the kinesiology uh, program. Uh, we would like to see perhaps uh, a, a facility that would be welcoming to the community as well in terms of recreation. And um, we would like to see better and bigger science facilities. We're really proud of the fact that our communication arts has now has, has restructured so that our, so we have a studio now, a broadcast studio. We're excited about that. And hopefully we see, because we see communication arts and communication expanding, that we would be able to expand uh, that capability as well. And then finally, uh, depending upon what happens with RCL, if you think about RCL, there are a lot of, if you will, spin-off associated business uh, opportunities that might adjoin themselves to the RCL facility that would give our students additional internship opportunities. But there are other uh, hopes and dreams and opportunities, so let me open it up to others here who might add to that in terms of uh, aspirational, because there's a lot, there's a lot that, uh, that still has to be done. Let me say that, that, uh, that beyond that, uh, clearly as our research grows and as our healthcare capabilities grow, there's no doubt that we will have add uh, health facilities here uh, for the North Miami community as well as educational facilities related to health. But that would be, you know, way out there. But is there anybody who, who, who would, has a particular uh, issue or opportunity that they think we should explore related to academic-related facilities that I haven't mentioned? Okay, Leo. No, you got it right behind you. So, um, you know, I, I pretty much live in the Wolf Center at an AC2. AC2 is, you know, School of Communication and Journalism. That's my major. I'm Leo Cosio. For any, anyone that doesn't know me, I'm student government president here at BBC. Um, I just really think that AC1 and AC2 need some updating. Um, I think, especially on the exterior. So, you know, I love all these interior, you know, updates that we're doing to, to AC2 for my program. Um, you know, it's a hospitality, of course. But I really think the exterior of the building needs a lot of updating. You drive into campus, AC2 is the first thing you see. In my opinion, it's just not a pleasant sight. Okay, let me ask our, our Senior Vice President for Business and Finance, who has responsibility for s facilities. His name is, his name is, is Ken Jessel. So I'm, so I'm Ken Jessel. It's, I... uh, it's K Jessel and K at FIU.edu. Uh, if you don't like his answer, light him up no, right no, now. No, no. Okay. Well, I, I hope you like the new paint job that we did on uh, the first building. Isn't that, uh, that done already? So uh, we know we need to do the same thing for the second. It, it, it's a little bit more complicated because it needs a lot of infrastructure repair. The building envelope in itself uh, leaks. And so there's no point in doing painting until we can get that corrected. But that is on our, our, our list of repairs. And then after that, we'll be doing some, uh, some uh, painting. We, we started with the library. We did a lot at the Wolf uh, Center. Uh, so we know that uh, it is a very valid concern of, of Leo's and one that, that we are working on to correct. Describe where those funds will come from, Dr. Jessel, or how we normally get, you know, maintenance oh, I only, funding. I only work on the spending side. Now we're talking about revenue, too. <laughs> <laughs> no, we, we, uh, we use a variety of different uh, funds. Obviously, we look to the legislature for as much help as we can get for infrastructure and repair dollars. There has mm -hmm. been a little bit of traction the last couple of years uh, in getting uh, additional dollars in because it's important to maintain the facilities that you have as compared to just looking at new new facilities. And when we had uh, uh, Senate President Negron here last year, that was one of his big themes. Let's let's do bigger investments in the facilities that we have and, and uh, hopefully we'll be getting in some uh, good dollars this year to, uh, to assist with that. It's never enough. Uh, University-wide, we have about $300 million of deferred maintenance, uh, which is a tremendous amount of money. Uh, but we're seeing support not only in the legislature, but the Board of Governors that has uh, commissioned uh, sight lines to do assessments of all of the universities so we can start seeing some of those improvements. Thank you. Yes, sir. Um, thank you, President Rosenberg. Um, my name is Luke. 
Um, first of all, thank you for being here. Um, throughout your entire presentation, you've stated and emphasized the influx of students that we'll be seeing here on this yeah. campus yeah. through the consolidation of kinesiology and the various departments in Case and Carta. But I think one of the major issues that all of us have faced here is the art is really the dining issue. During my the dining issue. Um, during my time in student government, I remember that my team and I carried out a bunch of surveys to poll the student voice and concern reg regarding the, the dining issue, and the results really came back as fear that there is an issue about the detrimental state of dining here at BBC. Right. So um, with the influx of students that are coming here at BBC, really by next fall, how do you plan to prevent this bottleneck that will occur like in the dining and the cafeteria during peak hours and allow like a flow of students to continue coming here through BBC? Tell me about the, the bottleneck. Um, so during peak times here at BBC, um, between like the hours of 12 and 3, um, especially in Tuesdays and Thursdays, individuals are not usually able to um, take their short breaks and go to the cafeteria and grab something to eat from the limited options and go back to their to their affairs because that, during that time, you have students and staffers and mass students who come by and try to grab something from our three options. So oftentimes it creates this, this issue where the line is backed up all the way to the hallway and individuals either have to defer to off campus option or the detrimental options in the vending machines. So <laughs> yeah, do you have any, I mean, obviously immediate plans, like it's yeah. really impossible. Do you have any long-term or medium-term plans towards like mitigating this issue? Yes, okay, so um, we regret those, uh, if you will, bottlenecks and, and difficulties that you're having. We want our students to be on campus 24-7, 365, because we see the campus as a sanctuary. We see the campus as a learning center. We see the campus as some place so extraordinary that, um, that, that we want our students here all the time. So that's, I want you to know that's my goal. And um, while we've come a long way uh, up here, we still have uh, we still have to go a long distance. And um, part of the logic of a high quality, impactful food service is that there's a market that makes it possible. And so in some respects, uh, the growth that you see here will help us to get where you want us to go. However, it's not, I know, fast enough and quick enough for for uh, those of you who have to wait in line extraordinary amounts of time. Let me, add, let me go back to uh, Dr. Jessel for a minute to talk about the process that is, going, that is going to occur. Actually, that's occurring now in terms of, um, of food service as it relates to the university and the Biscayne Bay campus. And do you not want to deal with it, Dr. Jessel? I could ask Amy to. No, no, of course. I'm happy to, to, uh, uh, <laughs> to do it. He's just a, he's no, just a gracious public servant doing the, his thing. The, the, uh, the president is correct. Obviously, it's a balance because any food program that you have has to be a sustainable program, right? So we understand that. And we have been working hard. Uh, we have the rotation options that have been very successful, and we've, over the, the last several years, have made uh, enhancements to the program that we have. Uh, we are going through a competitive solicitation. Our contract uh, with our current vendor, Aramark, is, is up. We're required to go through a, a, a process. And we have had numerous focus groups with students, faculty, and staff on, uh, on uh, this campus as well as the MMC campus. And we will continue that process. We have good representation. Leo, are you, are you on that committee? Leo's on that committee, so he can, he can be your spokesperson as uh, as the student representative, and we have faculty on that committee as well, to try to look at the optimal way of delivering, you know, food service uh, on our campuses more comprehensively. So that is a very, very important process, and please pay attention to it so your voice uh, can be heard in terms of preferences. Uh, with Mass, the, the, the school coming up, as we heard, we're still looking at uh, 2019. Uh, that is the plan for the, for the opening. Uh, we'll have additional students here. Uh, with housing, we're seeing more opportunities for, for utilization of, of, uh, of the facilities here. And as we expand the academic programs, as you heard from several deans, that will also increase the volume so we can have many, many more options. 
Uh, it's going to be impossible to say there'll never be a, a line at lunchtime. If you go to MMC at, at lunchtime, it's going to be very, very crowded. Uh, we have to stand in line there as well. If you go off campus during lunchtime, it's also going to be a, a peak time because people, unfortunately, take their lunch between the hours of like 11.15 and, and 1.15, and those are the, the peak, uh, peak times. We will, however, look at what we might be able to do uh, differently, maybe bringing in another uh, part-time person to assist at the register or at the takeout uh, uh, or the order uh, line to improve that. Uh, so I'll ask the team to make sure that we analyze, you know, where we are now. But we, we, we do want to provide a valuable uh, product. We want to provide a value proposition to our students, our faculty and staff, you know, everywhere because that's the way the program is going to be uh, the most successful. It has to be a self-sustaining program. Obviously, there are no tuition dollars or state dollars that go to operate it. The revenues that come in have to cover all of the expenses. But we believe with the right mix of products and the right uh, service deliveries, maybe the right kitchens in place as we go through this next round of negotiations will help uh, improve uh, the issue that you've identified. And you're right, it is one that we have uh, have been identifying for a long period of time, and it is on our radar screen. So, Luke, if you had, a, if you had just one, uh, you know, service that you'd like to see here or one restaurant or one food group, tell us what that would be. You, I need the mic here. I want everybody to, you know, <laughs> I want everybody to hear this. What? Yeah. <laughs> oh, he's telling you what he's telling. Uh -huh. um, I mean, it's difficult, but I don't know. You know what? If I want a good Chick-fil-A, I have to go to the Pembroke Pines. <laughs> So this would be something that would be beneficial to like this community right here. So I think Chick-fil-A would be a solid option. I don't want campus. you to go to Pembroke Pines. Exactly. I don't want yeah, to either, which is why I want it here. <laughs> okay, what's number two? All right, Chick-fil-A, what's oh number God. two? Wait a minute, there there has to be a closer location than Pembroke Pines. What is it? I hear Popeyes. I hear Popeyes. Do I have anything else? Do you have a room for a third option? Of course. Bring it on. Salad creations for vegetarians. Okay. Okay, yeah. <laughs> okay, good. All right. So I'm sorry. I think. Acai for these ladies right here. All right, ladies and gentlemen, Luke's going to serve as your representative here. Bring your bitch to him, and he will bring all to Leo. Leo, we're doing your work for you, but uh, yeah. But this is very important. We, we got to get it right on this round. So thank you, really. Lean in on this. Thank you very much for that. Yes. Uh, I just, um, like the that, um, actually, um, the research that I really want from here is Panda Spurs. OK. Yeah. All right, there's another request. Good. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Yes, sir. Please, go ahead. Pink shirt. Oh, no. Go yeah, are you done? Sit. Okay, all the way in the back. Yes, go ahead. Thank you. Thank you, President Rosenberg. My name is Marie Trejos. I am a student here at FIU. Um, and I'm just curious to know if my school has any plans to make our campus more sustainable. Um, one of the things I'm mainly interested in is food composting and making recycling mandatory. Um, food composting would be awesome if we make it Excuse me, I'm super nervous. <laughs> you shouldn't be. Um, but You're yeah, with friends if, here. if we can make food composting mandatory for in our cafeteria as well as in our dorms, I think that would definitely lead an example in our community. And something that was brought to my attention is the new parking lot. I think personally, it's a it's a big um, environmental impact. I was wondering if it's best to just um, do a parking garage. It wouldn't take so much space on our green land. So that's something I okay. So food composting and uh, recycling and recycling. Uh, who mandatory. wants to answer that on the team? Jim, you want to do composting? Once an hour? Recycling? You want to do recycling? All right, John. Thank you. All right, this is John Kyle, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, John Callen Facilities, and let me point out who your local hero is and before I say his name when you saw the three pic the picture of the three individuals from facilities up front there 
they're not here today because they're probably working and, and doing more hero work. Uh, but in another place or another organization, the next guy up might jump up and say, hey, they work for me and I'm the guy and I'm their boss. And he doesn't do that kind of thing because that was their moment. But the two individuals you have here at FIU and it's, it's at FIU BBC, and they're the best guys you possibly could have. Ed Furness, please stand up. And Matt Melke, you stand up, Matt. And what was the question? No, I remember, I remember the question. So on the food composting, that really goes to Aramark. So Amy, do you want to answer that one? So I'll do the recycling. And I, I can get you the data, but our recycling program is probably uh, the best of, of the SUS because we adopted a single stream recycling program years ago. And uh, we can get the data, but we really made it easy. And because of that, uh, you just drop all your stuff in one recycling bin. We're able to tap into the county's contract and we get that done. You don't have those multiple containers. So we do a lot of recycling here. The only thing we need is you have to put it in the recycle bin. We can't do that for you. Uh, Ed, or I think you have the data, Nick, if we can get it from Joe, but we'll, we'll get that data. If you give me your email, we'll send that to you. Every year though, when we do the Recycle Mania campaign, we're far ahead of all our uh, competitors and, and uh, UCF and UF really hate that. <laughs> Is there another question Composting. for me? Composting. We, no, Amy's going to do composting. Okay, Amy. All right, Amy. Yes, good afternoon, everyone. On the composting, we actually do do it at MMC. Uh, we work with the, uh, the FIU Garden Club at MMC, so we would definitely look for those initiatives. And as Dr. Jessel mentioned, on the invitation to negotiate, we really stressed out sustainability. Uh, we stressed, you know, wanting to make sure that, that current or incumbent vendor uh, or the new ones would definitely make sure that is a priority. Recycling, I mean, if you could... Leo's on it, so he will definitely keep us honest in that, in that regard. Yes, go ahead, Ed. Mike, can you use some mic, please? We have a site here. It's called the Urban Vegetable Garden, which would be a perfect compost. So if you send me your email, I will make sure to hook you up with that. Yes, sir. All the way in the back. Hello. Hello. How are you doing? I'm Patrick, everybody. Um, another thing on sustainability, would we be able to um, to possibly put windmills or like solar panels outside? Windmills, solar panels. Let's ask our vice president. I know we've looked at, we've definitely looked at that and... Um, yeah. I do want to say that this university is, of all the public universities in the state of Florida, what, nine years in a row now, we are the most efficient in, in kilowatt per BTU hours measures. Uh, we're still consuming a lot of energy, and there are alternatives, but uh, they're probably not cost effective yet. I mean, that's, that's a real issue, but we, we continue to look at uh, those options. Uh, the windmills I happen to like, but the other day I was listening to NPR on the way in, and, and there's a lot of controversy with respect to uh, birds, particularly migrating birds, and along the coast area here, I think that would be a big concern. But certainly we're, 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 we're looking at those types of options. As the President said, we are the most efficient in the state system, and we have been for the last six or seven years, right there at the top and we'll look at uh, alternate sources of, uh, of energy. We, we need to be mindful that um, while we have really competitive electric rates that this past year, I think our electric bill went up a million and a half dollars simply because of the increase in rates that are being charged. And so we're looking for ways to offset that because we don't want to raise 
to, we really can't raise tuition to cover that. So we are very mindful of the need to be more and more efficient. And if you see areas where we could be, where you know there are obvious gains that we could make, uh, please let us know. Please let John Cal know or Ken Jessel know because we, I mean, efficiency has to be an element of what we do, of our DNA. Uh, it's not just important in terms of managing costs, but in terms of the broader issue of sustainability. So your, your suggestions and ideas would be really welcomed. Mark yes. Sell, once yes. again. Uh, speaking of sustainability, uh, the university is justly famous for its work on climate change and sea level rise and the research. Uh, what are the BBTs and main campuses plan for dealing with sea level rise and climate change? Some of the, um, let, me, let me see if I can get at that. Some of the issues that we would like to be able to deal with are just cost prohibitive at this point because as you know, the physical plant is fairly dated and uh, the infrastructure is what it is uh, on one hand. Uh, and so the way we've dealt with storm and issues, we tried to become as resilient as we could, hardening up as many buildings and reducing the vulnerabilities as possible. But we're, let's face it, we are on the bay. We, <laughs> we are on the bay. I mean, we have to understand that a water event is part of our reality. And um, we, I'm very proud of the team, and that's why I talked about some of the things that they, they had done. Uh, John, are there, any, are there any things that really rise to be extraordinary as it relates to hardening and resiliency on this campus related to sea level rise? The challenge that we have specific to BBC is uh, we don't exist in a vacuum. And so if you came back after, after the uh, last storm, Irma, there was a fairly significant storm surge where the shoreline basically moved about, what was it, Ed, 70 feet? 70 feet in. And we were fortunate it wasn't any further, but the reality is if, if we get hit with that significant storm surge, BBC will likely be cut off, not because of BBC itself, but because of all the surrounding roads. So that's why this is an evacuation area, uh, and that's why um, uh, they're, 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 it's a tough situation. It's not like the MMC location where you can shelter in place. We really can't do that on this campus. Now what we have done is on all our construction, we have tried to build that to the, to the newer standards to where those facilities can withstand a storm and then after we can come back, it can be used uh, in a quicker time frame and in that sense resilient. Uh, but the older buildings that you have here, and Leo, I think you commented on it, AC1, AC2, they are what they are uh, as we upgrade the building envelope for AC2, we'll try to put hurricane-resistant windows in there, again, within the cost constraints of what we've got. And in that sense, while you won't be here for the storm, hopefully we, we can recover faster after the storm. J just as a matter of principle in terms of climate change, sea level rise, the approach that, you know, I, I refer to the facilities guys as the Philistines. So we're not the scientists, uh, but we can all agree on clean air, clean water, and clean earth. And so that's what we're focused on, and we try to focus on our, just like the Board of Governors is focused on academic performance, we're focused on energy performance. And so the greenest, cleanest, most sustainable energy is the electron or the energy you never have to use. So we try to keep our usage as high performing as possible, meaning we're using it as efficiently as possible. And if we don't have to use it, we're not creating that carbon footprint that then impacts uh, our, our Earth, the planet and the climate. 
I, I, could, I could identify a whole set of initiatives that our academic departments are taking that are truly exemplary uh, as it relates to education and research and um, reduction of, of, of uh, greenhouse gases and reducing carbon footprints. Uh, but as it relates to specific uh, hardening at, at our sites, we are taking initiatives, but there are limits to what we can do in the short term. So thank you, uh, John. Yes, sir. Go ahead. Okay, so why don't you repeat your question? Thank you, sir. Are there any plans in the near future to match the library hours here at the BBC with the MMC library hours? What specifically are you thinking so, about? So, for example, at the M so personally, I know I'm not the only one. I can't study at home, so I go to the library to go do everything. So I've personally been up at like 2 a.m., so I'll drive to the MMC to go study um, because the BBC library here closes, I think, at 1. Um, are there, there any future plans to match the library hours with the BBC as the MMC? Well, I really want to thank you for your, your diligence and uh, your, your ethic, your work ethic. That's admirable that you would go from one location to the other. And um, are you thinking about um, the final exam period or are you, you know, give me. Give just it, in general. Um, just in general. Right. I don't think, I don't see uh, the dean here from the library. Oh, there you are. Okay, dean, please. I didn't see you. Thank you. I second the president. This is a, a question or if it's a problem that we love to hear about because we love to hear that students value the library. Um, some of you are probably aware we've gone through really a two and a half year process at the Green Library to get to where we are as of fall 17 semester being open 24-5. There are a lot of considerations, just as Dr. Jessel talked about with food service in balancing traffic and demand with the cost of providing the service. Um, and as many of you, I think, are aware, at the Green Library, it was not only a question of staffing, but it was um, having to get significant investments in security to make it a safe environment for us to be open 24 hours. And we want to thank all of our students because a significant amount of the funds that went into the new security uh, systems did come from your tech fee dollars. So we thank you very much for that. Um, it is certainly something as our student population continues to grow here at BBC that we'll want to consider. and. Possibly a first step there would be experimenting with end of the semester uh, opening, just as we did at Green Library. So we will continue to take that under consideration. And we, again, appreciate the strong support we get from our students, because it's important for us to know that our students value the libraries. Thank you. Yes, Luke. Okay, so we've got time for, a, okay, here's one here, and then we'll go back to Luke, okay? And then I, I want to ask Chief Casas uh, to um, share with us some observations, if we could, please. Hi. Hello, everyone. My name is Priscilla. Um, my question is about housing. Due to the housing pricing, it is difficult to live on campus. How can that be changed, and why or why not? So the issue of housing is uh, unfortunately uh, a continuing challenge because the, we do not have a large stock of, of available housing and we try to do, we try to put up state of the art housing that is safe, that is clean, that is secure, and that is competitive so that our investors know that they will be able to, to get a return. And, um, uh, we're very proud of the of the new uh, of the new uh, Bayside uh, Tower, 
that has evolved, but we understand that there are still limitations for many students in terms of pricing. And we don't have an on-campus solution for you at this point, an alternative that would be viable. Uh, we regret that, but we, we simply don't have it. And so, uh, which means that either commuting from home or finding apartment share or house share uh, in the nearby area is really the only option. I'd like to see us perhaps have a better locator service up here, and uh, uh, I think that we're working on that, uh, but we do not presently have envisioned any other housing on this campus until we reach another critical mass of students. Do you have any suggestions for, for us about that, Priscilla? Okay. Well, I, I'm sorry about that. We do have uh, some pricing of differentials at the, Med, at the Medi campus, but that doesn't provide a good solution for you if you have to commute uh, here. Yes, go ahead. Follow up, please. Um, I mean, I guess you could make a program where FIU students could be connected with other FIU students who have to commute far, and they could find apartments together close to this campus. Because I do live in Broward County, and I drive an hour every day uh -huh. to be here. So do we, we don't have a housing share or bulletin board or some form of? We do. Joe, okay, Joe, you wanna talk about that please? Joe Pollock, who heads up our housing. We need a mic here, please. Oh, thanks. There it is. E yeah, uh, we have the unclassified website where people can post if they're doing housing or sharing or do roommates, and I'm not sure if, uh, but we can do some more publicity down on or up on this campus, but that unclassified, that classified website is what we use and we push out, and it is something that's really helped students find other students who are looking to live uh, with each other. And um, I think Dr. Rosenberg had mentioned too on the MNC campus, we're really working hard at making affordable options, and we're working with the team on this campus to maybe um, have some more affordable options in the building based on uh, view and room type. So if you're willing to look at not the bay, the prices will be a little lower. And that's something that we have been able to work with them to find something for some students to have an entry price that becomes more affordable. So we're thinking about it all the time, okay? Thank you. What, where would they find that uh, classified? Weather? Sure, it's classified.fiu.edu, or you can just Google FIU classified. Great. Yes, sir. One final question. Use the mic, please. So on the classifieds, and I'm, I'm not trying to bash you or anything like that, uh, but so I'm a transfer student here. So I was transferring, I, I did find the classified site, uh, but I felt just the UI, just the interface of it, it's really just rigid and rigid, and it's, I, I just feel like, if there's an app that students could use that's you know internally through FIU, it may get a lot more success. Um, but just, just we will it. develop an app, won't we, Joe? Yes. That's a great suggestion. That's the great suggestion. Let's make lives easier for our for our community. We can develop an app. If we can't do it, who can? Right? You probably could. All right. Tell him how to do it, and then maybe he'll ask you to do it. I mean, let's go. That's a great suggestion. Yes, Luke. I lost. Um, thank you, again. Um, so as an international relations, I've been using the shuttle to commute to MMC, to my classes in SIPA since May 2015. Um, and now I'm in my last semester, and I'm faced with, with the same issues. So um, earlier last fall, I was on my regular shuttle at 10 a.m. heading to MMC, and at about like midway through the turnpike, the shuttle broke down. Um, we were accompanied down to, um, down to exit 25, to the exit at FIU, by FHP officers, where the shuttle broke down again. And after two hours, we realized that we weren't going to wait to get all the way to um, Gold Garage, and we decided to get out at exit 25 and walk to class. And I kind of dismissed it because I realized, you know what? It just happens. It's um, electronics. It happens. So I didn't make a big deal out of it. However, um, recently I was driving down to FIU. I live in Dania Beach, so I live about like an hour and a half from MMC. So I was driving down to FIU, and I saw that on the side of the turnpike, proudly emblazoned in its FIU logo, the shuttle broke down again. You know, and driving right next to it, as like like seeing my alma mater like be surrounded by FHP officers, it was really just 
really saddening because I know exactly how it feels firsthand to be in that situation. So I'm wondering, I have like, it's really a two part question. Um, first, I know that um, we, for example, have a partnership with Academy where we get our, our shuttles from. Um, is it, like in the short term, is it possible to ensure that certain like um, grievances with the shuttle are met? I've heard many students, including right here, have stated um, that they have issues with the Wi-Fi connectivity within the shuttle, with just simple AC vents in the shuttle, which make the ride kind of a nightmare, especially at five o'clock in the summer. And also, in the long run, would it be possible to entertain the possibility of entering into a deeper contract that would allow FIU to have a stronger, um, a, a stronger like hold over their shuttles, even to the point of like toying around with the possibility of owning their shuttles in order to have a say in um, the fees and anything like that that could make it easier for students like me to commute to MMC. Okay, good. Uh, Tom, I don't think is there. You are. Okay, please. Thank you very much, and thank you for your question and, uh, and certainly your feedback. Uh, we are and have a, a great partner, uh, by the way, with Academy. Uh, we feel we do. A couple of things we've looked at. When you look at internalizing or uh, outsourcing your shuttle service, uh, one of the things is that you want to look at the size of the fleet that's available. Academy of Boston are actually here today, so I'll let them speak about uh, their service levels and, and, and the breakdown that you'd mentioned. Um, but you want to look at the size of the fleet and the resources that they have twofold. One is the evacuation of campus that was mentioned earlier and having that fleet available if we did have to evacuate uh, campus as John had mentioned uh, during a hurricane, those kind of things. And secondly, because mechanical breakdowns do happen, uh, we do run a shuttle every 30 minutes uh, from each campus. So we know that wherever that breakdown might happen to be, there's another shuttle 30 minutes behind that particular shuttle. Um, and certainly, uh, I think that uh, their yard is about, uh, well, not too far from here, but a few miles, and they can dispatch quickly from the, the yard. So they have the resources, the lift, and the fact that from 6 a.m. to 11 p.m., there's a shuttle leaving from each campus every 30 minutes, uh, gives us that, uh, that backup level of uh, support and comfort level that, that we have uh, in our shuttle service. And uh, I'll introduce James from Academy, and he can talk about his services. Hi, I'm James. I'm with Academy. Uh, we do do go through a major maintenance program with our shuttles. They are maintained. They're on a regular uh, preventative maintenance service. As you did say, there are times that it is mechanical. It happens. Sometimes, you know, most of the time it's not preventable. But our shuttles do go through uh, a preventative maintenance Every so many miles is something that my mechanic would have to speak about because they, they know the parameters of it. But they, there is a certain uh, guideline that, all, that our mechanics abide by. Our buses go through, every single one of our buses go through the, to make sure that everything is up and running. I'm out there periodically. If you do see me, come see me. If you know that there's a problem with the shuttles, come talk to me. We'll make sure we check them because any time that we hear that there's an issue, when it comes to mechanical-wise, air condition, whatever it might be, come talk to me, come see me. I'm usually out here at the bus stop or I'm over at the MMC bus stop. We'd be more than happy to make sure we address any issues that you all may have. Do you have an email? Yes. Uh, <laughs> my email is jfox, F-O-X, at academybus.com. So the best way for, for Mr. Fox to know your pain is for you to communicate if it? You, if you do send me an email, I, I will answer you, I'll reply to you, and I'll make sure I forward that email over to our um, uh, maintenance supervisor to make sure that it's all taken care of for you. Thank you. Thanks, James. Yes. If you could note my email as well, it's thartley at fiu.edu. Uh, you're welcome to uh, send those to me or copy me in addition to Academy. We do track their service levels. We have GPE tracking on, every, on, the, on the buses, on the shuttles. Um, so, uh, in, on the app that you can look and see when the next shuttle is, we do track their performance on that. So, if they're late for a delivery, if they're late for a pickup, we track that and uh, have weekly meetings with Academy on uh, on their service levels and on their times. What so, about internet issues? The internet issues, uh, because occasionally uh, vehicles do break down, 
Uh, they will run in another bus without the internet services that we've put on the bus. It's, it's Academy standard uh, internet services. On the designated shuttles for F between MMC and BBC, we've loaded up uh, the internet. The problem with the standard internet that Academy runs versus our designated shuttles that we run, that we load the internet on, is happens to be uh, the number of towers and the cell phone towers. When they lose connection, um, so that, uh, for example, if their service provider's AT&T, um, the AT&T tower may drop somewhere on the turnpike between here and MMC campus. We've loaded on our shuttles uh, multiple SIMS cards so that we have both Verizon, AT&T, T-Mobile, uh, multiple providers that if one service drops, at and cell tower, for example, is down a week that day or drops connection, then Verizon picks up and picks up for the rest of the shuttle. So if you're on a shuttle uh, with a bad internet connection, if you'll let us know that, we would appreciate it. It could be that due to mechanical reasons or just uh, switch out for preventive maintenance, uh, that Academy switched in another shuttle bus on us uh, for that particular reason. It may not be on our regular um, Wi-Fi system. Great, thank you. Thank you, okay, Luke. Okay, one final, I see a gentleman has a ear in the green jacket, and then we'll turn it to Chief Casas and we'll be completed. May I ask you a question? I've, I've had my whole hand up for, for a little Where? bit now. Right oh, here. there you are, okay, yes, of course. Quick we'll question. We'll do two, two questions at the same time. Go ahead, sir. No, go ahead, go ahead. The buses don't run on the weekends, right? I just quick no. question. No. No, because last semester I had an exam at, uh, I live near BBC, and I had exams on the Saturday at MMC, so I was wondering if it was possible to have the buses run on weekends. Was weekend. that final exam, or was final. that a midterm, or what? Midterm and final. Both of mine for uh, accounting was over there. In case it happens again that I have an exam at the other campus, I had to take two metro buses and uh, get up there. I was yeah. just wondering. Yeah, I think it, you know, I will look at it. I'll ask Mr. Hartley to look at it. I think midterms would be difficult, but I think final exams were covered, no? During the final exam period? Not, not on our weekdays. Week weekdays only. Well, but we need to think about that for Saturday because we're teaching, we're doing exams on Saturday during final exam week, are we not? Yes. Okay, we, get, we need to, yeah, we need to look at that. So I get you halfway there. I get you halfway there. Okay, yes, sir. Yes, thank you, President Roosevelt. Hi, my name is Daniel Velasquez. I'm a student here first and foremost. I just wanted to thank everybody here. Uh, I can honestly say I'm, I'm very thankful for everybody here, and, and we all get to enjoy um, great quality of service, and we see every department here, every organization put a lot of effort to make this campus great. And um, I think the students see it, and, and we see progress, so um, I'm just happy about that. I, I do want to say uh, there is some problems with transportation and not just from the buses side, which I have a question here for, but I would like to add to that uh, also in the, in the management and, and some issues that I've seen as a student, um, as a resident also in Bayview and in other, with, from other students that I've had here. Um, I think a lot of these issues we can also resolve um, between all of us, you know, thinking within each other. I have my friend here, Ronan, he's a, a student of the engineering and software programming. He could definitely develop an app because I heard a little bit about that. Um, but the, the question here is, the transportation fees included in tuition, why is there not, uh, why is there a, a service fee for the shuttle? Um, which I understand is, is, doesn't cover everything, and you know, it's a contract kind of thing. Um, but also, when it comes to parking and transportation, um, a lot of students try to park near uh, the lot five, and um, when it comes to parking, you know, that lot is shared with the Coven Center. We do have limited parking here, and everybody has probably experienced uh, some sort of trouble finding parking uh, at some point in campus. And um, basically, um, last semester, for example, we, we, my car got moved, got towed, I got ticketed uh, several times. And um, one of the times that I got ticketed, I left my car on the side of um, Lot five, which was a parking space for, for us in, in Bayview. And um, I got four tickets in a row. Um, without really notice, I got one email for them. And it was within, with, within midterms week. Um, so I didn't really know because it didn't go out to my car. I didn't move my car. There's like very few spaces available. And when I tried to appeal the citation and I tell them that there is no like signaling, nobody told us that we couldn't ever park there. And we had been parking there for a year and a half. 
pretty much their answer was like, just because you've been parking there for a year and a half, it doesn't mean that it's right to park there. And they denied it. They also put a boot in my car um, and they moved it. So like fees and costs came up to like $250 for me, just from a bunch of different things. And that was like for with the winter break. Um, so I needed my car. And I'd, I don't like to ask my parents for help. I like to like take care of my own stuff. Um, but I, I had to actually like help them like get some money from them because I needed my car for the winter break. Um, and when I tried to address this issue with uh, parking and transportation, um, pretty much they failed to address any concerns. I felt like even management, I had to talk to the MMC lady because the BBC lady uh, wasn't available at the time. I couldn't get her information. Now I have gotten her information. The student government we're working to work on some resolution for parking and transportation, but um, I know from different students that have experienced this trouble with parking and transportation just getting ticketed, and I just don't see the benefit of this. Like, I understand, yeah, like, it's not right and we all, we all have to cooperate, but like, giving student fees of like $250 and, you know, booting your car and all of this is definitely not the way to prosper um, education and, and foment growth, so I think it's a pressing issue here. Yeah, well, uh, first of all, um, I'm glad to hear that our that our parking enforcement people are working. So it right. sounds to me like you're one of the reasons we employ them. And uh, I'm sorry about that. Um, I really am. And um, I think that uh, some of these questions that I'd like for you to address uh, privately to Mr. Hartley and have a conversation, if you would. Um, obviously, we want you to have a good experience here. And um, we don't want you to have, we don't want students when they wake up in the morning to worry about where they got to park. We don't want faculty to have to worry about that either. And we also want to keep costs down. So um, we're always uh, balancing that. And, uh, but we do expect kinder, gentler, reasonable, thoughtful, people who were able to listen to you and to understand things. Absolutely. Can we do a better job with signage? Absolutely, it sounds like. Can we, um, maybe we could develop a system so that if you're getting a second and a third ticket, we make an effort to try to understand why, and if it's just because you are not interested in the regulations, then that's your choice. For but sure. if it's because of some structural bottleneck, we should know that and see if we can help. So Tom, let's yeah. Absolutely, yes. I, I think you're right in that sense. Uh, I mean, for me, it was just kind of like one thing triggered another. Yeah. Like the tickets then yeah. didn't get approved the, the appeal, then it got booted, then got moved. Um, but I think just minor communication, um, like letting us know that you can't park in certain spots or communicating with housing, because when I went to housing about the, the concern, they said it was a parking thing. Parking is like, well, you should have known. We're like, okay, how, how am I supposed to know? So maybe this minor communication, better communication between students and parking would, would make a no, big no difference. No question, but, but I'll check in with Mr. Hartley afterwards to find out what he told you. And uh, I do think this is an issue, but we, we want people not to live in fear at FIU because of, you know, the fact that there are too many cars. Right. And so we're, we're working through that. And I do think that parking... My sense is that they've, they've, they've really transformed things very nicely. There's still a lot more work to do, so please have that conversation. Awesome. And Thank let you. me ask uh, Chief Alex Casas, who is responsible for our campus safety and security, to uh, have a few comments, updates for you, because there's nothing more important than your safety, as far as I'm concerned, and since we haven't talked about that or addressed it, I want the Chief to to comment on that as appropriate. Thank you, Dr. Rosenberg, and I'll be quick. I know everybody's ready to go. I'm getting the evil eye from our administrators over there. I can <laughs> see you guys. Um, and I'm happy to report I have no outstanding parking tickets. So Tom, I'm good with you. So we're, we're in good shape. Um, just real quick, a little bit of a heads up or some information for you on how we've enhanced over the years um, the way we police the BBC campus. You at a minimum get the same level of service that MMC gets but we've actually enhanced it in a couple of ways. Um, I don't know if you've seen the dog that we have assigned here, Coda, or our lab canine. Uh, you may have also seen motorcycles here a little bit more over the course of the last year. We've extended our pedestrian and traffic safety initiative up here because um, we want BBC to have at least the same level of service, but what we've taken it a step further is all our officers at BBC are assigned to what is known as a community-oriented policing unit. Now, what does that mean? Uh, those officers have a different 
philosophy when it comes to policing, more of a problem-solving approach. You probably know them by name. You probably encountered them a lot more often than our students get a chance to encounter them at MMC. Those officers are selected from a pool of officers. It is a competitive interview process. So they want to be here, and they actually get paid more to be here. They get an additional 5%. Um, not that that matters, but what it should matter to you is that this is where they want to work. Um, this is the assignment that they chose. We treat them a little bit differently than the other officer because it's more of an elite unit, so they have that, that approach uh, to policing. One more initiative that I'd like to talk about real quickly, and this is championed by Leo and your student government association, is our RAVE application. We have a safety application that's also available on your campus. If you go to the uh, Apple Store or the Android Store and download RAVE Guardian, when you log in, it'll turn into FIU Guardian, and basically what it is is a safety application that allows you to notify us when you're, in, you're having an incident, you need some help. Um, if you're walking to your car at night, it has a tracker that monitors how long it took you to get to your car, and if you took too long, it sets off an alarm and it notifies people for you. So thank you, student government, an example of how we work together to continue to enhance um, your life here and, and your, your experience here at BBC. And speaking of student government, Dr. Rosenberg, Leo would like to take a moment. He's got something that he would like to present to you. You got to talk about it. Leo. So we designed the shirt this year, and uh, you can show the audience. It says BBC is the place to be, so we want you to wear that at MMC. <laughs> and we also have a pin that matches the shirt. That's great. Here you go. Love it. Thank you. Thanks for coming. Thank you. So. Um, I just want to end with a with a, a quick story. Thank you for the T-shirt. It's the only one I've gotten today, so uh, I'll use it. Right. Thank you. Uh, so a couple of weeks ago, the FIU Foundation board held a planning retreat at the at Port Everglades, and it was on one of the ships uh, there. Uh, owned by Carnival Cruise Lines, which is another great partner of ours. And um, as you know, it's the, these ships are amazing buildings, but they're hard to get into, and it takes a while. So as we were uh, entering in and showing our IDs, this, uh, a gentleman who was one of the security guards for the company found out that we were FIU. And um, he walked up and he said to me, he goes, uh, I'm uh, really proud of FIU. And I said, well, tell me. He goes, yes, uh, my son just graduated from FIU at the last commencement. And um, he's got a great job as an engineer and it's because of FIU. And then he paused and then he said, and I want to tell you, I have three other kids who went to FIU and who graduated, and I couldn't, I couldn't be happier. This is something that I didn't expect. You know, we're minding my own business, getting onto this ship, and out of nowhere, someone who's been impacted by your work and by your commitment expresses in incredible gratitude. This is an individual who I don't believe had a college education, didn't have the benefit of, of a of perhaps even a formal education at the advanced level, and there he is expressing his deep appreciation, and he was happy. He was proud. When he heard FIU, he lit up. I saw it, and it's, and it's because of what happens here every day and what we mean to so many people, people who we may not know but who are out there who are counting on us. So there's no doubt in my mind that conversations like this are going to make us better and stronger because we're all willing to lean in, we're all willing to think, we're all willing to exchange views and hopefully uh, improve our opportunities to help others. And I want to thank in particular our students who are here, who, who, who believe deeply in us. I want to thank our professional staff who find ways to pull, to make minor uh, miracles, major miracles, just because sometimes it's so hard to get anything done. And I want to thank our faculty uh, for their commitment 24-7, 365, to the life of the mind, and in particular, 
to the educational enterprise that we call uh, this FIU. Can't wait for the next town hall, can't wait to talk about all the good things that, that you're going to make happen uh, over the next 12 months. I want to thank student government in particular for their leadership. I want to thank student, student affairs, uh, Vice President Larry Lunsford, Anthony DeSantis, and the entire team, and for uh, those who put together this, this, great, this great gathering. So thank you all. Uh, counting on you to have a wonderful semester, and hopefully I'll see many of you at graduation, if not sooner.